Welcome, everyone. If you can believe it, this is our last Zoom presentation for 2021. And we have been together 17 times this year with all sorts of different programs. And I want to thank you all for being here for all those programs. We brought in speakers from all over and we've had um, guests come in from all over and it's just been a wonderful time. So we are working on some programs for next year. Um, we're gonna be incorporating both live and Zoom and where I'm working with Seth actually to figure out how we are gonna be able to bring you people who are not in the area into those presentations so that you can enjoy them with us. Um, so let me see, I have a whole list of notes here I wanted to talk about. Um, our next event at Lawson Tower is gonna to be on December 18th. We are doing the Frozen Tower Tour. The tower and all the grounds will be lit up for um, the winter. Um, and we will have visits from two special frozen princesses. And they will be there bringing some music and song with them. And we'll be able to do pictures and we'll have hot cocoa. And you'll find that on our Facebook page and on our website. And on... Um, I think the right before Christmas and then right before New Year's, we haven't got the dates yet. We are going to have Lene Badger is gonna be doing concerts at the tower. She'll be doing holiday favorites and then she'll be doing music to ring in the new year. Speaking of the new year, we will be having our first in-person presentation. Um, we haven't done anything in just about two years by the time we do that. And it will be with Art Millmore. And he's written a book called And the Sea Shall Have Them All. And it's about the loss of the steamer Portland in November of 1898. I think you've all may have heard of that, the Portland Gale. It's a wonderful story. He'll have books with him. He'll be doing a book signing. And if you're on our email, you'll get that information. You can find it on our website. You can find it on um, our Facebook page. We're going to be having a bluegrass night. Um, probably in February. And um, we're just coming up with the information for that. We'll have music and CP's Pizza will be joining us with pizza. We'll have some adult beverages available and it's just gonna be a really fun night with the WSU band. And um, rumor has it that Lyle Nyberg is just about ready to um, launch another book. So we're hoping that will be out in time for early winter or the end of the winter, I guess, or however you put it, for him to come in for another live presentation. So we're excited about that. But right now we're really excited about the society's new website. In the wee hours of this morning, we launched a brand new website, which you can find at situatehistoricalsociety.org. It's been in the making for months and months. We've got some very dedicated volunteers, archivists, trustees who have been working very hard on this site. It's beautiful. I toured it today. It's everything you'd want to know about Situate and more. It's got lots of great features. You can make donations. You can become a member. You can buy some of our, our books that are on sale. Everything you want to know pretty much about Situate, you can find there. So please, I, I'd love you to take a look at that. Maybe when you get off here tonight, take a look, take a tour around it. And um, I think you're really going to love it. And we're very, very proud of it. So I think that's all I have for you for announcements. So now we're very excited to have with us Anthony Amore, who is a art security expert. He is the director of security and chief investigator at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And he is going to talk to us all about stealing Rembrandts. And I'm sure a lot of you on here tonight can remember waking up on March 18th in 1990 and hearing the story. So Anthony, we're gonna turn it over to you. And at the end, Anthony will answer questions and you can put them in the chat now if you'd like. And um, welcome Anthony.
Thank you. Thanks, Gene. So I'm going to do my share screen now. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, it's um, second time I've had the opportunity to speak to this group. I was lucky enough to speak at the GAR. Um, Gene, I don't remember how, how many years ago it was. I want to say maybe two or three. Mm, uh, maybe a little longer than that. <laughs> really? Yep. Yeah, that's right. COVID throws the whole thing off. Yes. Yeah, I don't. I, that's a good point. Um, maybe two or three years before COVID. So um, I really love the place, and it's unfortunate that everything's virtual now. But soon enough, we'll be back in place. Um, but tonight, I'm going to talk to you about stealing Rembrandts, and going to try to give you a different perspective on art theft, and explain to you how these things really happen. So in the introduction, Gene mentioned that I'm the director of security and chief investigator at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And um, I started this 16 years ago. And uh, I was about halfway uh, through the life of this, this uh, tragedy, the art theft that happened in 1990. So I'm working really hard and I'm gonna to talk to you about that tonight. Um, but I'm gonna to talk to you in general about art theft using theft of Rembrandts as an example, to, the way to illustrate how these things really happen and, and who does them. But one of the uh, things that is interesting about my life, my career, um, in a tough way sort of, is that I'm an art theft expert by necessity. So you can't do what I do for a living without making yourself an expert um, in the field. So. When I first joined the Garden Museum in 2005, I set about learning everything I could about every art theft that ever happened. That was my mission because I had worked in counterterrorism uh, the first half of my career, the first 15 years. So now I'm switching over to art crime. And uh, so I said, I, you know, I'm a, a person that immerses myself. So I, I dug into all the research and I was looking at every art heist you could find. And one of the first lessons I learned is that art theft is a massive, uh, criminal enterprise. It happens constantly. It, it's in the uh, the amount of art stolen and trafficked and looted and and such is in the billions every year. It's up there with gun running and drug smuggling and money laundering. It's it's a massive inter, uh, transnational criminal problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I decided when I was doing this research that I should focus in on one artist because I didn't have a lifetime to begin, I needed to get to work right away. So I started researching Rembrandt thefts and I found that um, Rembrandt is the most often stolen artist. Excuse me one sec. <clears throat> and um, I'll explain to you why that's, the re why that's true and why that's, that happens. But I found uh, when I wrote this book, it came out 10 years ago now, it, that um, it still sells really briskly because people are interested in this topic. Um, 80, 82 Rembrandt heists had happened as of the writing of this book. So I had a rich field from which to draw. And I decided that I would write this book to illustrate to people um, how this stuff really happens. Because if you watch movies and, and Hollywood productions about art theft, it's way off from the reality, but it's much more interesting. One of the other things I learned in the course of my research is that Massachusetts is a horrible place for great paintings. Art theft happens in Massachusetts uh, in, in the most amazing way. And it won't surprise you as, as um, people who live here in the Bay State, but every it seems like every sort of major crime happens here on a big scale and art theft is no exception. In fact, um, this is a partial list of some of the well-known artists whose works have been stolen. And my research continues and I found amazingly uh, this really interesting news story recently, the front page of the newspaper in Western Massachusetts on the day I was born 19, in 1967 was about these two lawyers who were arrested by the FBI for holding stolen art. And incredibly, I did not know this until recently, the, um, the biggest modern art, contemporary art theft in history up to that time happened here in Massachusetts. It's just Remarkable, the biggest theft from a home in American history happened in Stockbridge. The biggest art heist in history happened in Boston. Just something about the water in the Bay State. Um, but what, what's really interesting to me 
is um, that theft happened in Provincetown when I was mentioning it's contemporary art. And it was at the home of the famous artist Hans Hoffman. Um, and thieves broke in and they stole really important paintings. Um, but I'm just giving you that background. It doesn't surprise you to know that if, it can, if something bad can happen, it'll happen here. But the first theft I want to talk to you about, and I'm going to argue, uh, make the case tonight to you that the three most significant art heists definitely in American history all happened in Massachusetts. And the first one involves this person here. His name is Florian Monday. And many of you um, who are my age or older will remember there used to be a TV show called To Catch a Thief, starring Robert Wagner uh, many years ago. And some of you will remember his character's name was Al Monday. Now, Florian Monday was a prolific thief here in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island at the time. So much so that when the show became popular, people, his friends started calling Florian, they started calling him Al. Um, because he was like Al Monday, constantly stealing things. And to this day, he goes by Al. Everyone knows him as Al. And um, remarkably, he would basically steal. This is uh, late 60s, early 70s. He would basically steal anything he had his hands on. That's the easiest way to say it. But Al has visions of grandeur. And guys like Al aren't content with, say, stealing a car worth back then, say, $7,000. and and you know, selling it for 700, because basically the black market is around 10%, give or take. Um, so he wanted to make much more money to live a much more extravagant lifestyle. He loves jewelry and gold. You can't see it here too well in this picture, but he's got rings all over his fingers, his big chunky gold rings and gold chains. And he um, was better educated than most criminals. He had graduated from Providence College in the 60s. His mother had taught him a lot about art and antiques as a young man. And he was taking some courses at Assumption College in 1972. And he tells me he stepped out of a building one day and he saw across the street from him, the Restaurant Museum. And it struck him that he should steal art. He knows what valuable art is. And if you steal something that's worth millions and you get 10%, now you're talking about serious money especially back then, um, even now, obviously. So Al loves to exaggerate. Now, Assumption College is not across the street from the Worcester Art Museum, but he, he always likes to put a dramatic flair to his story. So he went to the art museum and would walk the halls and spend significant time in the galleries, studying the paintings, but more importantly, studying the security, how the paintings were connected to the walls, where the guards were, were there any cameras? What type of security devices were there? You know, when was the place busy? When was it not? And he could do this often. And this is one of the reasons that museums are robbed so frequently, because the whole purpose of a museum is to let someone, uh, like any one of you, go into a museum and spend time staring at paintings. And you know, if um, tomorrow you go to the Worcester Art Museum and you decide to stand in front of the Rembrandt for five minutes, no one's gonna question you, that's why it's there. Museums are all about accessibility, which is, is, which is why thieves love to try to rob them. So that's what Al did. And uh, here's an important lesson about art theft. His favorite artist, he tells me, is Renoir. And there were Renoirs at the Worcester Art Museum, but he didn't target those because Al was in it for the same thing every art thief is in it for, which is money. So he targeted what he estimated to be the four most valuable paintings he could reasonably carry out of the museum during a heist. And those paintings were two works by Gauguin, a Picasso, and the museum's Rembrandt. It's a portrait of St. Bartholomew. Now those are the wise choices. Uh, so again, he knew art. Those are, those are very, very valuable works. So, Al was wise enough also not to decide to go rob the place himself. Why do that when he could get a couple of young, tough guys who followed him around and you know were his henchmen to do it? These guys were in their very early twenties, so he gets the two, uh, the two, the two thugs he's going to use, and he walks them around the museum and shows them the paintings and shows them the roots and explains to them the security as he understands it, so that they're comfortable with the place. And again, doesn't raise alarms because the museum is there for the public to enter. 
Uh, now the Gauguin painting, The Brooding Woman is on um, a board, it's on wood, it's not on canvas and it's large. So Al figured they needed a getaway car with a big capacity in it. So he had another guy steal this station wagon. Now, those of you who uh, remember vehicles back in 1972 know this is a compact station wagon. So station wagons aren't like they are today. We can get them in every size and SUVs and you name it. That's what they were, just like this. And it was perfect size for that large painting to be put in the back. So now he has the car, he has the guys. And the plan is for the two thieves to go into the museum when it's open in broad daylight. It was uh, scheduled for a May afternoon in 1972. And that strikes some people because you always imagine these art thefts happening at night. You know, guy rappels in through the skylight and has the red laser beams around him and such. And, uh, you know, he craft, craftily takes the item. He's wearing a balaclava and he, you know, he, he, he's very smart and slick. But no, just over half of these things happen during the daytime. And the reason for that, um, when I tell you, I think you'll see it's obvious. If you're going to break into a museum at night, I can tell you museums when they're closed are like fortresses, you know, all the bells and whistles, everything they have, everything we have in place to protect the place is on when we're closed. So you have a lot of hurdles to get through. But if you come during the day, like they plan to do in Worcester, the doors are open for you. You're halfway there. No one's going to stop you on your way to the paintings. So that was the plan. And the two guys came to Al's house on the day of the theft. And he went over the plan with them one more time. Then he gave them both blue windbreakers to wear. And the reason he gave those to them was because Al had a hunch that if these guys looked like reasonably like they worked there by wearing the same outfit, that the visitors wouldn't interfere because they would think these must be museum employees taking these paintings down. Those of you who are on right now listening to me, unless you work in a museum or volunteer or what have you, you haven't seen paintings removed from a wall in person because we do it when we're closed. Um, so how would you know though, if you don't work in a museum, if, how would you know this was, you know, if guys went about it calmly and they looked like they belonged, that's half the battle, right? So that was the plan. And the guys are ready to go. Al sends them on the way out to the car, but they don't go. And he says, what's going on? And they said, where's our gun? And Al said, gun, what, what gun? We, we didn't discuss a gun. There's no, it's not gonna be an armed robbery. Uh, you know, I showed you the guards. They're all elderly gentlemen. They're, they're not gonna put up a fight. Um, you're two young, tough guys. You don't, we're not gonna use a gun. And the guys said to him, well, we're not gonna do it without a gun. We're professionals. So Al gives in because he wants his paintings and he goes and he gets a gun. You know, because everyone has a stolen revolver sitting in their house, right? But Al did. And he went, he gets his gun, gives them the gun, and they, they're ready now. They're happy. They look inside the, um, the chamber, and there's no bullets. So now they put up another argument. And Al goes, and he relents, and he gives them one bullet. And I can remember him. We were speaking over breakfast one. He was telling me the story. And he said, I held the bullet out, and I pulled it back. And I told them, don't put blood on my paintings. And by that, he meant figuratively. He meant if you shoot somebody in the commission of this heist, you escalate the seriousness with which the, the authorities will investigate it and will respond. And I said, no, of course not. We're not going to shoot anybody, but we have to be armed. So they march off to the car. They drive to the Worcester Art Museum. And here they go. This is Renaissance Court in the Worcester Art Museum. It's very large. And like most museums, this big hall is basically cement and marble. Um, and uh, it's cavernous. And at the bottom of that photo, the very bottom, you can see a portion of this giant Antioch mosaic that's in the middle of the floor. And there's rails around it. Um, Worcester Art Museum is a lovely museum. They have one of the world's best collections of Antioch mosaics. And uh, that's to keep people from walking on it. That's why they had rails. So the thieves walk in, they walk around the, the, um, the tiles. Now you see that bench there in the photo um, along that wall of the first floor? 
when the thieves are walking by that bench, there are two high school seniors, two females, particularly attractive. And um, I've met them. They were standing there and the two thieves who had instructions from Al that when you go in there, don't stand out. Don't make yourself noticeable. It's just like if you've, if you've ever seen The Godfather, where Michael Corleone is going to go shoot the ca police captain. And he's being trained on how to do this by Clemenza. And Clemenza tells him after the shooting, don't look anybody in the eye, but don't look away either. He said, don't run out of the place, but don't walk either. In other words, to the extent possible, don't be remarkable. They say, oh, yeah, we understand. So as they walk in and they see these two attractive females, instead of just going on their route, what do they do? They tell them, you two might want to sit over here. Something big's going to happen. So that's not something that you read about master thieves doing in these uh, crime thrillers. You might, you might be interested in. So, but that's what they did. They, they made themselves identifiable to these young girls. But they walked up the stairs, headed up to the second floor, went to the four paintings that Al uh, uh, identified for them. And they took them from the walls and Al Monday's suspicions were confirmed when nobody interfered with them. Visitors just assumed it wasn't very busy, but the visitors that were there just assumed that these guys must work here if they're taking paintings off the wall in broad daylight and you know they're not making a mad dash for it. Um, nobody, nobody wanted to interfere. So they walk back down the stairs, they, they uh, go to walk out. Now, what you can't see in this picture is that's right at the entrance. The entrance would be along the left side of this picture. And right outside of the circular drive where the car is parked. So they just parked wherever they wanted, walked in, took the paintings, they come back downstairs and they make a big mistake. They step onto the mosaic. And when they do, the guard at the front door, an elderly gentleman named Phil Evans sees them. He's talking to someone at the time, but he sees them and he tells them to stop and get off the mosaic. But when he, you know, they, they, they think they're caught for a second, but he's just telling them to get off the mosaic. But he slowed them down enough for him to notice, thank God, that they were carrying these four paintings on a museum. So he yells to them again to stop. What are you doing? That sort of thing. And the thieves take the gun and they shoot the guard. This poor guy is just, you know, he's a museum guard. They shoot him near his vital organs. He's hit near um, his left hip. He goes down. I want you to imagine if, especially if you've ever heard a gun fired without air protection on. It's a startling experience. Guns are loud. Imagine hearing a gun go off in this cavernous cement and marble room. It's terrifying. And people are terrified, right? Um, this, now they see the guard on the floor. He's bleeding profusely. Fortunately for him, the person he was speaking to at the moment was a visitor who was a nurse. And she knew immediately what to do. And she saved his life. The thieves just went on their way. They went out to the car, they put the three smallest paintings in the back seat, and they took the biggest painting, you know, as I told you, it was for the station wagon, and it was supposed to go on the way back. What did they do? Instead of putting it in the way back, they put it on the roof of the car, and the guy, the passenger, put his hand out the window and held the painting to the roof. And um, so they speak, they take off, and they're gone, and uh, they've pulled off a major heist. Uh, they did a lot of bumbling. They didn't follow the rules like they were supposed to, but they just pulled off a major, major art heist, one of the biggest ones in the world. So what happens is they take the paintings to Al Monday's house. They get rid of the getaway car, and then they go to their local bar. As I mentioned, um, the, the guard, his life was saved. So Al has the paintings, he's happy with what they've done, but he now knows that there was a gun fired and he's very, very, very upset about this because they have figuratively put blood on the paintings. <clears throat> the two thieves go off to, uh, it's about two, three o'clock in the afternoon. So what do they do? Uh, they go off to the local bar where they're regulars. And because it's Worcester, places packed even in the middle of the afternoon right everybody there knows them and um there's tvs on in the bar guys sit down they have a couple of drinks to celebrate what they just pulled off but you have to remember guys that steal art are like these two guys they're just thieves they're just crooks they're common criminals 
And this was just another thing they did. Next week, they'll, maybe they'll rob a bank or, or do a home invasion or some other, you know, sell a bunch of drugs or something terrible. Um, but they're happy. They, they're celebrating. They're sitting in the bar. And all of a sudden, the TVs in the bar go to um, breaking news. Now, it's 1972, so it's not as slick as it is nowadays. But you remember, and I remember, um, I was only five then, but you remember there was a time when if the TV said there was breaking news, there was actually news breaking, like it was something. If you put the news on right now, it always says breaking news, and it's nothing. But back then, if you saw breaking news, you, your stomach kind of sank because it was either going to be some military action somewhere, some celebrity or world leader died, or some other really terrible tragedy has just happened. And this is one of those things where you remember from me, I remember when John Lennon was killed and, you know, it was a, a breaking news and you're like, oh my God, it's something you'll never forget. So everybody in the bar kind of quiets down and the local news anchor comes on TV. It's not a national story. It's a local story. So they, they really start to listen. And he says, breaking news out of Worcester. So now pin drop, it's dead silent. Breaking news out of Worcester. Uh, there's been a, a major robbery art heist at the Worcester Art Museum. Two thieves have um, stolen four paintings, including a Rembrandt, a Picasso. A guard was shot and critically wounded and rushed to the hospital. The thieves are still armed and at large. Police and the FBI are on scene. Details at six. Oh my God. So, all these guys that are in the bar are thinking to themselves, who did this? I mean, we must know who it was. These, you know, th this is the type of crowd that would know who would be involved in this thing. And there's a lot of, you know, buzzing inside the bar and the two thieves are there and they see this and what do they say? Hey, that was us. Now, I don't know if any of you have been in investigations or that sort of work in your life, but I'm gonna give you a tip. If two criminals, known criminals, announce their guilt in front of their community and say, that was us when a crime has happened, that's a very good lead. And <laughs> that's something the police have to follow up on. Excuse me. So um, they, the, the police get word about who this probably is and they go and get these guys pretty quickly. Now, this is the painting they stole. This is Bar uh, uh, Rembrandt's St. Bartholomew, and it's really a beautiful painting. And uh, it's, every time I look at this image, I think to myself, you know, I got this image from Worcester. It's a very high resolution, beautiful photograph, the one they used to represent this painting, but it doesn't do it justice. So if you if there's a painting you really like and you have the means, you should try to see it in person. When you see this in person, it bears the hallmarks of what makes Rembrandt portraits so great. And one of them, one of the things is that the light comes from the subject and you can't see it on your computer screen, but in person, you, you sense this light coming from the person. Vermeer is great because of the way light goes on people. Um, that's why these are my two favorite artists, but this painting is just remarkable. So he painted St. Bartholomew three times in his career that we know of. And then each time it's sort of the same pose. He looks drastically different in the face in each painting, but each time he's holding a knife. And the reason he's holding this flaying knife is because St. Bartholomew was uh, skinned alive at the stake. And uh, martyred saints are always painted showing the instrument of the martyrdom or some symbol, symbolic representation of their martyrdom. And this one really resonates with me because I attended St. Bartholomew school, uh, an elementary school. And I remember in the first grade, Sister Martina telling us that St. Bartholomew, our patron saint, was skinned alive at the stake. And when you're six years old, that sticks with you for a long time. So uh, 48 years later, I'm still talking about what Sister Martina told us, this horrific story about St. Bartholomew. But it's just a great painting, and I hope you have the opportunity to visit Worcester. It's a wonderful museum. Now, I mentioned the police were aware uh, that they should arrest these guys, uh, Thorin and Carlson, who pulled off the heist. That's them. I love these period crime photos. It's, it, it's one of my passions when I'm doing a book, doing research, is finding these old photos. And this is such an era photo. Obviously, the vehicles, 
uh, bring back memories, the sort of thing my dad would drive. But I love how these two thieves who have pulled off an armed robbery and nearly killed a man by shooting at him, they're just walking in casually, he's handcuffed in front of them. They even let him have a cigarette while he's walking and they're just chatting. I mean, nowadays these guys would be uh, in, in leg irons and hand, obviously hand, uh, a chain around them with their hands and they'd be very much restrained. But uh, they go into court and um, they're arraigned on the charges. And because the police know these guys work for Al Monday, they're quickly onto him. So what do they do? They go to Al's house and they knock on the door. And he says the paintings were hidden right above him in a drop ceiling. That's not possible. They're too big, but they're hidden somewhere in the house. And uh, the police want to talk to him. And he tells them to get lost because he can, because they don't have a warrant at that moment. Um, he knows his rights. And, but the police let him know, you know, we're on to you. We'll be keeping an eye on you. So Al realizes he's got to get these paintings out of his house. You know, his wife is there. He can't have this. He, he didn't think they were going to be on to him so quickly. So he has to find a place to hide these paintings. And what does he do? He doesn't put them in some secret trap door like you see in the movies or, you know, behind a bookcase where you pull the lever and the bookcase turns around or some fancy alarm system with a safe. No, he takes them to Rhode Island to a pig farm in Rhode Island called the Pachillo Pig Farm in Johnston, Rhode Island, the most polluted place in the United States at the time. It was the first EPA Superfund site. And he takes these paintings, they're in a case, and he hides them in a hayloft at the pig farm. So I want you to think about that for a second. This is not the Thomas Crown affair, right? This is real life. These paintings are hidden at a polluted pig farm. Now, the not only did the police know that Monday is behind this thing because of who was arrested, but also other bad guys know. And these two particularly tough bad guys are uh, about to be sentenced for a home invasion. And they see this news story about these paintings and they decide they confer with each other and decide, you know, if we can get these paintings back and we give them to the judge, maybe he'll cut us a break. So they go to Al's house too. And they do what the cops can't do. They, when he opens the door, they just stick a gun in his ribs and say, take us to the paintings. And Al knows these guys well enough to know they'll shoot. So he does, he takes them to Rhode Island, they get the paintings and they, these two guys bring them back to the judge and they get a tiny little sentence reduction. Uh, so tiny that they were upset and it was a big scene in the courtroom. They thought they were gonna get a big break, but they didn't. But more importantly, the paintings are back. And these are the FBI agents and Worcester police officers who were behind the investigation. And you can see here, the first painting on your left, closest one to us is a Woman and Child by Picasso. Um, the brooding woman is in the center, the one that should have been in the way back of the station wagon. And then there's a portrait of a woman by Gauguin, those two. And then in the distance, you see the Rembrandt St. Bartholomew. And unfortunately, Al felt that the frame was weighing him down and he took the frame off the painting and threw it in a river in uh, Rhode Island. So the frame is gone, but the painting was back. And the happy ending is here where Phil Evans, the guard who was shot, is back home and so is the painting in the Worcester Rock Museum. So this, paint, this story is really important uh, historically because it's the first time in history that a museum is held up at gunpoint and paintings are stolen. Uh, of course, it had to happen here in Massachusetts. Um, but it's also important because it illustrates the problem with stealing such art. You know, Al was certain he'd be able to fence these things just like he did all the other stuff he stole. But what he didn't realize that when he stole these paintings, they would become international news and they'd be on the front page of papers around the world, and they were. And um, they became instantly too hot to handle and too uh, expensive for anybody to take a risk. So he was stuck with them. There was no place for him to put them except for a hayloft at a pig farm. Now, the second of these historic thefts involves this man here, Miles J. Connor. And if you Google Miles, you'll see that he's an incredibly famous art thief, an incredibly famous criminal in Massachusetts law. Um, much more interesting in terms of his criminal history by far than Whitey Bulger, 
He is someone that I have described to the media as the greatest art beef who's ever lived. And I believe that firmly. And um, he's a member of Mensa. And he's a very, very interesting person. He was born in Milton. And um, what happened with Miles is, this is a picture of him in prison. But what he had done was in 1974, some friends asked him to accompany them to, they were going to go to the Woolworth estate in Monmouth, Maine. The year before, the Woolworth estate had been robbed of 50 paintings. And when the newspaper reported this, they mentioned that there was still 50 there. That's how big the Woolworth collection was. Miles' his friends decided, why don't we go and take the rest? So Miles is the expert. You know, they went to Miles and said, will you help us? And Miles is an immensely interesting guy um, because his art thefts had different motives uh, at their root. And I just wrote a piece. I don't know if any of you subscribe to Airmail. It's that publication from Graydon Carter, who used to be the editor of Vanity Fair. And I have a story coming out in Airmail about Miles' motives. And I spent a lot of time with Miles interviewing him and talking about why he did what he did. In fact, I, I had lunch with him today. And um, this, it, it, getting inside his mind is really a um, unique opportunity for someone who does what I do. So Miles went to, Miles went to, um, uh, the, the Woolworth estate, sorry for, sorry for that, my, my uh, partner's eight-year-old, lovely eight-year-old daughter keeps coming in to say hi, I'm sorry. So um, they, when they go to the Woolworth estate, they break in and it's four guys and there's just paintings and statues, but not just art, but valuables like silver, um, some samurai swords and Miles is a samurai sword expert, but Miles can't help himself. He steals these three paintings by the Wyatts. NC and Andrew Wyatt. And they're very, very valuable. And they take them and they get away with it. But it's not long before an informant working with the FBI sets Miles up and he's arrested with these Wyatt paintings. And the FBI put him in the car and they say, We got you now, Ma we got you now, Connor. Let's see you get out of um, how did he say? He said, uh, you're gonna have a, you're not gonna get out of this one. And Miles said, just you watch me. And this isn't Miles' bravado. This is from the FBI agent, you know. So he's in a car, he's arrested, but it's Massachusetts, so they don't hold him. It's Massachusetts in the 1970s. Barely anybody got held. But, I mean, this is back when they were doing furloughs to murderers. So Miles is in trouble because he's already uh, awaiting trial and sentencing, actually, for another theft, but at the state level. So now the feds and the state have him. And the prosecutors want to put him away for a long time by making sure he gets consecutive sentences. Miles needs the sentences to be cut and he needs them to be concurrent. So he tries to pull some strings. He goes to a uh, state police detective he knows, a very powerful state police detective, who is friends with his father because Miles' father is a police officer um, and a well-respected uh, police officer, a real honest cop, a good guy. Uh, his brother is a state trooper. And Miles's other brother is the ch Roman Catholic chaplain for the Boston police. And Miles always says of these guys, I don't know where they all went wrong, uh, but he's clearly the black sheep. When he talks to the, the detective, he tells him, Miles, you're really in trouble with this one. I don't, I don't know what you can do. It's going to take a Rembrandt for you to get out of this one. You should never have put that idea in Miles's mind. In April of 1975, in the afternoon, just like in Worcester, a van pulls up into that circular drive in front of the MFA. So it's an overhead view of the MFA. You can see the Fenway uh, there, and that's the Fenway entrance. And the van pulls into that circular drive there in front of the entrance. And two guys get out, and they enter the museum as visitors. And one of them is Miles Connor. He's wearing a hat, a blonde wig. Uh, he loved disguises. And they walk into the museum as visitors. They go up to the second floor, and there, they choose wisely. Miles targets this painting, Girl with the Fur Trim Cloak. At the time, it was called Portrait of Elizabeth Van Ryan. It was thought to be Rembrandt's sister, but it's actually just a portrait of a woman, um, but it's just a remarkable painting. And I mentioned to you the importance of seeing these in person. This was privately owned, so it's hard to see. It was on loan to the MFA. And I got to see it in 2012 
and was completely blown away by this painting. It is so magnificent. You can't believe a, a human being with a brush could make something like this, but he did. So Miles, this is painted on a wood panel and Miles yanks it off the wall. Two elderly guards come over. They just shove them aside. They run downstairs back to this entrance here. Um, before they leave, they're in another uh, um, uh, atrium type area with cement and marble. They fire warning shots. Again, people are horrified. I've spoken to witnesses. They hit the floor and they're just terrified. Miles and his compatriot run out of the building. They turn and they fire warning shots at the steps. Nevertheless, a guard at the museum, an unarmed guard, who was a former Boston police officer, chases after them and gets close enough to grab the painting as they're getting in the van and there's a, a tug of war between the thieves and this guard. Finally, one of the thieves points a gun at him. Miles says, don't shoot him because he understands you can't shoot someone for paintings. So the guy just strikes him in the head with the gun and the, the guard is injured. He's shown his, his, his injury here. And the car gets away and Miles is gone with the paintings. But the thing is, nobody knows it's Miles Connor. Uh, nobody knows who stole these paintings. There's no clues left behind. There's no fumbling with the, uh, with the, um, you know, going to a bar and saying that you did it. The paintings are just gone. But soon enough, the authorities get word um, that the painting is available. And Miles in jail does, uh, negotiates through his lawyer the return of this painting, which he does not have because clearly he's in jail, but one of his friends does. And his friend orchestrates in, uh, New Year's Eve return of the painting in an elaborate um, plan in which he he's never identified and the 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 detective and the prosecutor are sitting in a car and the tr their trunk opens and something goes in the trunk and the trunk closes and they never see who did it. And it wasn't until recently that um, Miles is, one of Miles' friends admitted he was the one who did it. But when they did it, the painting went back and the MFA got it, no questions asked. Miles got the sentence reduction he needed and everyone lived happily ever after. And the reason I tell this story as important historically is because the first time on a big scale that a criminal used a piece of stolen art to negotiate with authorities. And that is one of the, one of the reasons people, when they steal art and they can't sell it because it's too valuable, don't just give it back because they might be able to use it the way Miles Connor did. To this day, that happens. So um, Miles really made history in an, in an ugly way. Um, but when he tells you the story, you sit there just saying, he's a charming guy. He's just uh, a unique character. Now, not all of these things happen in Massachusetts. They happen elsewhere. This painting was taken from the Dulwich Picture Gallery in 1962, along with this other Rembrandt painting, Girl at a Window. And that's where the paintings were hanging before the thief stole them and cut a, had climbed back out this hole he had cut in a door to get away with them. Incredibly, this painting here was stolen three more times. So all told, this painting by Rembrandt, the portrait of Jacob the Guy in the third, been stolen four times. It's the most often stolen painting in the world. It's called the Takeaway Rembrandt now. In 1930s, 19 paintings were stolen from this castle in Great Britain, and uh, including a Rembrandt, and the police were on the trail of thieves immediately, and the thieves panicked and uh, burned the Rembrandt that they had. So that's the only one that was destroyed. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm certain that our Godner paintings aren't destroyed because you can't find an example of a masterpiece that was definitively destroyed like this um, in the last, say, 85, 90 years. Even Rembrandt's house in Amsterdam has been robbed a number of times, but there are no paintings, no original paintings there, but etchings have been stolen. That brings us to the bane of my existence, um, the Godner theft, which is number the third one I'm talking about, not in terms of importance, but chronologically. 
And as I mentioned, it's the biggest art theft in, in American history, but I, that's, that's a misnomer. It's the biggest theft of anything ever, anywhere. No bigger heist in the history of mankind than the theft of these 13 works from the Gardner Museum. Now, as you probably know by now, it was 1.24 in the morning of March 18, 1990, and two thieves approached the employee entrance on Palace Road, the Gardner Museum. They rang the buzzer and the guard, against his training and against policy, buzzed them in based on the fact that they said Boston police were responding to a disturbance. And what the guards were supposed to do was dial 911, which is a fail safe. If the guys weren't really cops, the dispatcher would know and they'd be on their way. And if they were, they'd say, let them in. So it's what he should have done, but he didn't. And human error is at the root of so many great tragedies, of course. Now, these drawings are of the thieves. And you say, well, there are two thieves. Why are there four drawings? Well, the guards couldn't agree perfectly on which was wearing a fake mustache. So the, the composite sketch artist drew them uh, both with a mustache on. And it sounds crazy, but those of you who follow crime are probably aware that eyewitness descriptions are really unreliable. And it's particularly true in this case. I mean, the guards only encountered these guys face to face for, I don't even think 90 seconds, maybe not even a minute. And you don't look at people when you're encountering them, even police officers in intense situations and try to remember their facial characteristics. You just have a general idea. So these are really good just for eliminating people. We know, for instance, that the, these were men that they were average build, they were white males, um, that uh, they were local based on their accents um, in their approximate age. But even that's questionable because back then the guards said around 30, basically. Um, but now when you talk to the guards who are in their 50s, they'll tell you back then I thought 30 was old. You know, the guards, these guys could have been in their 40s too. So all we can say for sure was, was white males from Boston, the Boston area from Massachusetts, local guys. So they, the, the police officers talk to the guard behind the desk and um, they say to him, you know, we've got a report of a disturbance, anything going on? He says, no, nothing. He says, anyone else working with you tonight? And he says, yeah, I have one other guy here. So the police say, we'll get him down here. And it takes him about 30 seconds to arrive. Um, once he gets down to the watch desk, the two guards are together and the police officer says, um, "You two, uh, for, actually, I should take that back. He says to the guard who's behind the desk, this guy, he says, you know, you look familiar to me. Do I know you from somewhere? And the guard says, no, I don't think so. Says, Let me see your ID. So the kid hands his IDs to him. And the cop says, yeah, there's a warrant out for you. Come out from behind that desk. And the kid does. And once he does, the police officer says, you two are under arrest, assume the position. So he tells them to stand up against the wall and to be frisked, but he doesn't frisk him. He just, they both cuff the two, the two cops cuff the two guards. And once the handcuffs are on, he, tell, he tells them, this is a robbery. If you don't put up a fight, you're not gonna be harmed. We're here for the paintings um, that, you know, don't, don't, don't uh, put up a fight. And this guard here says, they don't pay us enough to put up a fight. And it's kind of a sarcastic thing, but it's true. He's absolutely correct. These are just observe and report guards. They're not there to, you know, they're not Navy SEALs, as I always say. They're there to just keep an eye on things. And um, they did the smart thing by submitting. So the, they are handcuffed and the thieves put duct tape all over them. And that's a picture, it's a good illustration of what it looked like. And they take them into the basement and they leave them down there. And then they come back upstairs, <clears throat> excuse me, and 24 minutes has elapsed and they haven't even started stealing anything. That's really remarkable because art theft usually takes, I don't know, between five and 10 minutes max, right? So, but this one took 81 minutes. So it tells you that the thieves were fully aware that the police were not on their way. They, they had some insight into the museum security. This is uh, what it looked like the next day. This is a guard and you can see in the room that big blank spot in the wall, you can barely make out, um, I'll show you more pictures, but you can barely make out a frame laying on the floor. These are the paintings from that Dutch room. That's where they went first, right to the Dutch room, second floor, 
directly for Storm in the Sea of Galilee, that famous painting there in the center, Rembrandt's only known seascape, very large, five feet by four feet. Um, they took uh, the one on, the, on your right there too, Lady and Gentleman in Black, which is also very large, and they cut those two from the frame. Um, the only two they cut were these two large ones. And then they took this small self-portrait etching. That image on your computer is much bigger than it is in person. It's only two inches by two inches. And um, the reason is they came for Rembrandt's and people steal Rembrandt because everyone knows who Rembrandt is. Everyone knows Rembrandt was great. Everyone knows old, great paintings are valuable. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. If you go into Situate High School freshman class and you ask them, have you ever heard of Rembrandt? They're all gonna raise their hand. They might not be able to identify a Rembrandt, but they'll know the name. If you say to them, have you ever heard of Jackson Pollock? Very few hands are gonna go up, right? Even though his paintings are very valuable too. So that's why Rembrandt is stolen so often is because of the awareness of him as the greatest painter who ever lived maybe. These are the other works that were stolen. So there were five Degas sketches. There's one there up in the top left-hand corner, uh, jockey leaving the paddocks. It's got watercolor on it too. The bottom left-hand corner is a painting that thieves stole, probably believing it was a Rembrandt. When Mrs. Gardner purchased it, she thought she was stealing a Rembrandt. I'm sorry, buying a Rembrandt. It was called uh, Landscape of an Obelisk. And it was actually painted by one of Rembrandt's students, Govert Flink. On the top right-hand corner are two incongruous items that were taken, these two objects, a Napoleonic um, finial, a bronze finial, and a beaker, a Chinese beaker from 1200 BC. On the bottom right-hand corner is a very valuable, beautiful, small painting by Edward Manet that was stolen from the first floor, which is a very odd, um, a different sort of theft that happened that night. Even though all these paintings were taken together, this is the only painting taken from the, the first floor. Uh, and it's um, the, the alarms in the room from which this painting was taken, the alarms never went off in that room. So it's a great mystery that we may never know the answer to. But uh, I save arguably the best for last, the painting in the center is the concert by Johannes Vermeer. And what you're looking at is the most valuable single thing that's ever been stolen. And it remains missing to this day. It's one of only 36 known works by Vermeer. Um, it's just a remarkable thing. And as I'm looking at my computer screen and seeing it here, I see it to my left here and full size image in my, in my uh, office here. It's not the real one. I'm sure some, uh, some people think I'm involved in the heist, but I, I was not. But these are the paintings. And uh, this is a close up to show you what it looks like, sort of. I can't show you the whole thing, but one of the corners of the frame the next morning, this is the frame that held Lady and Gentleman in Black by Rembrandt. And um, so that wood you see, that light colored wood, that's the stretcher. That's the, the frame around which the canvas was wrapped. And then that stretcher is attached to the frame that you see that gold ornate frame and you see pieces of canvas hanging out, but those are not painted canvas. That's a supporting canvas to keep the, the painting firm. So the painting is cut out in a pretty good rec rectangle. So you can see it's, it's not jagged edges of paint sticking out. Um, to wrap up the Gardner uh, matter that what I should point out to you and I always should point out is that we have a $10 million reward for information that leads to the recovery of these paintings. So if you know where the paintings are, you don't even have to bring them to me or bring me to them. You just have to tell me where they are and you're $10 million richer. And we work in this case every single day. Um, and I can tell you that uh, these things combine the, the amount of effort with uh, the FBI and, and me um, and the $10 million reward and the fact that the U.S. Attorney's Office is willing to discuss immunity leads me to believe that eventually we will get to the promised land and return all 13 of these works to the museum where they belong. Last thing I want to show you really quickly is right after my book came out, this drawing by Rembrandt called The Judgment was stolen in Marina del Rey. And the LA County Sheriff's Department and I spoke 
because it was a big media outcry, but they did a smart thing. They made it an even bigger media story. And Captain Mike Parker, the LA uh, County Sheriff's Office, blew this image up on the internet. It was all over the place using social media. It was not well known, but he made it well known. And then I would tell the press in, the, in LA, I have a message for the thieves. If, you've, if you have this picture, you've not stolen a picture, you've stolen a problem, give it back, leave it somewhere, call the authorities and hope the whole thing goes away. And on the third day after the heist, that's what they did. They left it at a church and it was recovered. And I tell you this because I think in the future, for instance, if the Godner theft had happened in the age of the internet, so much information could have got out to the public right away that maybe we would have got, gotten back right away too. Um, the internet is a great tool in identifying missing people and objects. The last point before I take uh, some questions is that my latest book, The Woman Who Stole from Mir, is out in paperback now. It came out a year ago, but paperback just came out and um, it got rave reviews, I'm proud to say, from the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. It was an Amazon bestseller, um, New York Review of Books. And it's an incredible story about the only woman ever to steal masterpieces. Her name was Rose Dugdale, and she did it for political reasons. And I think you'll be blown away by her story. Um, and I'd be honored for you to read it. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Jean or take any questions that might pop up on my screen. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Anthony. Can you stop sharing your screen? Sure can. And we can see if we have any questions. Let's see. Okay. I do, wait a minute. My pleasure, Jean. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me, Anthony? Loud and clear. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, thanks. That was really, really interesting. And as regards to the Gardner theft, so the two thieves, do you think they were paid ahead of time to go in and steal certain paintings? Or they just randomly picked some? I mean, the fact that they picked that one out in the first floor makes me think, oh, you know, they were told ahead of time that somebody wanted to buy it or something. Uh, no, no. I, when these type of thefts happen, there's not really, there's not really a buyer in the traditional sense. Like someone might think like, I want you two to go and rob this Manet from the, the one that's on the first floor because that's an important painting to me or I want that for my collection. That's not exactly how it happens. Now, thieves who might have been paid would be paid for committing the crime. Not, it's so in the movies, you see, like, I'm going to get this master thief and I'm going to give him, you know, I'm going to pay him $100,000 to steal this particular painting by, uh, you know, Matisse. But that's Hollywood stuff. In, in real life, someone might say, I need these paintings because I want a get out of jail free card, or I think I might be able to sell them. I'm going to give you 25 grand to go steal these paintings um, and just go steal those Rembrandts. I mean, the guys, when they came to the garden, they came to steal Rembrandts. Um, I think the rest of the stuff that they took were probably uh, were trophy items like the Degas sketches with the horses and and uh, the Napoleonic finial with the, e, um, with the, the Chinese beaker. Yeah. Um, but it's not, I, 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 I hope I'm answering that correctly. I don't, I yeah. just don't want you to think there's some collector who pays a guy to go steal something for his collection. It might be someone who pays guys to go steal something valuable. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, it's, it seems foolish to, to steal a painting like that because it is so famous. Yeah, it what turns you out to be foolish. It, Ronald, it turns out, I agree with you, and it turns out to be foolish. Um, and they learn this only after the fact, though, because these guys that do this, don't they don't research history. They don't say, you know, I'm gonna, I want to steal something. Let me go into the microfiche at the Boston Public Library and 
read about the history of this. They just see it as an opportunity and they do it. And, you know, all the museums in Massachusetts had been robbed before the Gardner. So sometimes people say, well, the Rock Gardner was robbed because the security was notoriously bad. That's baloney. We were the last one robbed. Um, museums get robbed. They always do. I can't think of a museum that has not been robbed. Um, I literally cannot. You know, when I was with Miles today, we were talking about this big heist he did at the Mead Museum out at Amherst College. I mean, every place gets robbed. Um, um, but they don't do research when they do it. They, they figure, I can get that thing. Let's see what happens. What are you going to do? Put them in the cellar and go look at them yourself? <laughs> They're pretty close. You know, when they... Yeah, they that's the only happens, thing you can do. Yeah, what happens is they, a lot of times they wake up the next morning and they see the newscast and it says, oh, you know, how they, they see, well, it, it, they're too valuable. So they hide them in a crawl space or inside drywall or something. And uh, maybe they'll use them someday. That's the sort of thing, just like you said. They don't even go and enjoy them. They hide them from the world. So when Miles wasn't planning thefts, and I guess he's been out of prison for a number of years now. I mean, what does he do with his time? Did he ever actually work for a living? Or, you know, I find oh. him really fascinating. He is fascinating. He, um, well, the only work he ever did, he was a, he was a major rock and roll figure. In yeah, I know that. Um, I mean, he was huge and he was pl playing concerts constantly, but he was never employed, you know, he never had a nine to five or any, anything resembling a work schedule. Um, it's just, there are just some men who weren't born for that. And he's this brilliant, uh, I'll show you this. He, he gave me this today. This is something he made when he was in Walpole. Can you see this? Look at the scrimshaw he made. I mean, it's absolutely, wow. right. He could do anything he put his mind to. He went to rock and roll. He's in like the New England Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He steal art. He's the greatest art thief who ever lived, you know. But um, it, it's a waste of talent. It's a damn shame that he couldn't put himself to something more uh, productive. Yeah, they had actually um, agreed to let him study at Harvard Medical School at one time. <laughs> That's smart. I mean, like I said, he's a member of Mensa. He's but. He did what he did, and he, I talked to him, you know, all the time, including today. And you're not gonna, you know, he has, he he doesn't live well. Like he's, it's not like he's got all this money or anything. Um, he's got um, a collection of all of the stuff he had stolen in a mass was stolen from him when he was in jail, and he has antiques that he's bought on his own legitimately, um, but he has no regrets. Mm. Has he ever had any, well, not insight about who stole the gardener or, I mean, just given his mind, what have, has the police or you ever talked to him about, what do you really think about the gardener theft? Well, that's why I met with him. I spoke to him. I agreed to be in a documentary he was making in return for him speaking to me. And he told <laughs> so me everything. He's told me everything he can. I mean, I know he was not involved. He was in prison at the time. And he, um, believe me, if he could tell me where the paintings were now, he would. So when things come up, um, I'll talk to him. I'll ask his opinion. Uh, I have no problem admitting that when we raised a reward from 5 million to 10 million, I asked him what he thought. You know, what, do you think that's a good idea? That sort of thing. He, if, if he could help me, he would. And he still tries and he tells, you know, Miles in the mid to late 1990s had a heart episode. I forget what it's called, but it, it affected his memory. So his memory works in very strange ways. Like he'll, he can remember everything about his Japanese swords, but he can't remember that he and I spoke yesterday or, yeah. um, it, it, you know, it's just a fascinating, uh, you know, for, for someone who does what I do, it's just like a unique thing. It's like if I was a baseball uh player and i got to be I, I formed a friend a friendship with babe ruth he'd be like well of course you would but he but he doesn't have information as to where our paintings are now hmm. wish he did anthony we've got a question how many gardner paintings were canvas and boards 
Uh, okay, so um, the etching was on paper. The degas were on paper. The Manet is on canvas. The Rembrandts are canvas, canvas, paper. The, the flink is on a um, uh, oak panel, a board. And um, the one, they, they tried to take our fourth Rembrandt and they forgot it. And that was on a panel, oak panel as well. Hmm. And we have another one. What's the percentage of paintings recovered in the US yearly? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no definitive percentage on that. Um, oftentimes when paintings are recovered, it's done very quietly. Uh, so nobody has that data, believe it or not. But estimates are just based on the ones we do know is when it's like a masterpiece, it's probably around 70%. When it's a, a lesser known or unknown painting, it's very, very low. Okay, and we have another question. Do you have an art background? I studied art history in college, but not as a major. Um, but I was not brought up in an environment where going to an art museum was something we ever did. Um, however, when you work in one, like I do, um, you become, just by osmosis, just by being in an office and hearing people walking by, never mind talking to them, you, you form a pretty strong art background. So sometimes I think like, hey, maybe I, I wonder if I should get a master's in art history, but then on the other hand, I'm like, why would I spend that money? At, what am I going to learn that I'm not learning already? What's the total value of the painting stolen from the garden? Oh. Oh. Um, well, I always want to mention first that when we talk about the value and the value of them is intrinsic and it's, uh, they're part of a larger piece of art that Mrs. Gardner created in terms of the museum. Um, estimates in terms of the dollar value somewhere I would I would say I'd guess somewhere between six and seven hundred million dollars they're priceless that's so Ronald thank you for saying that because they are the true definition of pricelessness because yes, people say that all the time about paintings oh so they oh a, a priceless painting no they're not priceless other thing you can sell them but the Gardner paintings can never be sold per Mrs. Well, Gardner's will so they don't have a price tag and they never will so oh, they can never be painted again. Right. But I mean, like what He's I mean, is, um, <laughs> the other night they had a big auction at Christie's and a Van Gogh went for like $46 million. And the newspaper will, will refer to a painting like that as a priceless painting. Well, no, there is a price. There's 46 million. But the Gardner paintings can never be sold. So there really is no price. They are priceless. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do and, you think... Do you think the paintings are still in this country? I do. Um, I think if they left this country, we'd know. Um, and I know that paintings that are stolen in the United States don't usually leave. Um, it's very rare for a painting, a masterpiece to be stolen here and recovered elsewhere. That meaning elsewhere in another country. Sure, sure. Do you think they are still, they are still in good condition 30 years later? Yes, like that's one of the reasons I wrote Stealing Rembrandt's, to look into these sorts of questions. These are all the things I answered by doing the research for that book. Um, so these are excellent questions. And you, you'll find that when paintings are stolen, these older paintings, when they're recovered, sometimes it needs some conservation work, um, but they're always in a condition that they could be shown again. One painting was stolen and it came back. It had developed so much mold that the paint was separated from the canvas but they repaired it. Um, and I'll tell you the interesting thing is even if the paintings were being held for the last 31 years in museum conditions, they still have to be conserved. They have to be studied. They have to see the stability of them. There's all kinds of work that would go into it. So if we got it back tomorrow and you looked at it and said, it's perfect, you couldn't just put it back on the wall. They would, they would study them for quite some time. Do you think the paintings are still in Massachusetts? Uh, I couldn't say that for sure. I would say that they're probably not far from Massachusetts. Typically, paintings are recovered in the pretty close vicinity to uh, where they're stolen because they're so hard to sell. There's no point in moving them. Um, but, you know, they, there's always an exception to the rule. Are you still getting leads or, you know, things that you're following up on? And how many, like on average, do you get? <laughs> get a few a week 
Um, I think it's interesting. You're, you're going to see a story in the, in the Boston Globe uh, in the next week or so. I, I didn't participate in it, but it's going to say that this guy, um, well, you'll see it. I, I, I really like the reporter. I don't want to burn the story, but when you read the story, remember me telling you this. I get calls all the time from people who say they've seen our painting, right? And they're not lying. They just think they've seen it. And it turns out not to be our painting at all. It turns out to be maybe a poster or it turns out to be something that looks sort of like our painting, but in their memory, um, they start to think of it as our painting. So it happens constantly. This, let's say Thursday, and I was out of the office today. So three, there were three days this week, I got three, I would say four calls and emails this week from people saying they saw, it's always the storm in the Sea of Galilee. You know, it's, and uh, I always wonder, it's like, well, is that because it's so recognizable and so, and it's shown so often, or is it because people, you know, they all the storm, they don't know the other ones, so they think they saw the storm. It's, um, yeah. um, but it never, it so far, obviously, has never turned out to be the case. Well, a lot of young artists uh, studying art uh, copy paintings like that. Mm -hmm. They see pictures of it and they copy it. Some of them are good and some of them aren't. Most of them are not good. No. Um, and it's really easy for me to tell yeah. right away when somebody sends me a picture. Now, I'm not a lot. Most of them I couldn't do, but you can tell right away. That's, you know, you're trying to copy Rembrandt is you're, you're asking for it. You know, you're not trying to copy like Jackson Pollock, where it's just paint splatters. You're trying to copy the greatest artists who ever lived. And on a, on a painting as elaborate as the Storm and the Sea of Galilee, you know, it's so elaborate and complicated and the motion, you have to be able to do the light in the water and each of the, the um, apostles and Rembrandt, he painted himself in there and the demeanor on Christ, forget it, forget it. It's not worth trying to copy. I've seen, you know, these in China, artists are taught by copying. That's their technique. And you can go online and buy an oil painting of the Storm and Sea of Galilee right now. That's reasonably close to the real thing, but it's still, you, you know. It's yeah. Not. You, can't, you can't beat the master. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's why he's the master. That's right. Um, do we have a comment? I love the gardener and hope you are successful in retrieving them. It is a gem and so is the Worcester Museum. Aren't you nice? You're a gem. You're a gem for saying that. Thank you so much. I, uh, that I was, really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I will be at the Gardener on Monday to see the Titan exhibit. Titian. Titian, I'm sorry. I couldn't read it. It's no problem. a really exciting opportunity to, to see them all together. Many thanks for keeping them safe for us to see. The Gardener is a real treasure. Thank you. That's really kind. And I'm really glad you mentioned the Titian exhibition. All of you, if you have the opportunity to see it, it's been called by... Art yeah. Critics is the most important art exhibition of our time, not just at the Gardner in Massachusetts. It is the first time in 500 years that these six Titian paintings have been reunited. And Titian is as great as it gets as well. And to see these and you know, painted over a 10-year period and to, to see the progression of Titian's work from unbelievably great to astoundingly great and um, to know they'll never be together again. So if you don't come see them before January, you're never going to see them together again because they'll never go on loan again. This is a once in a, not lifetime, once in a history um, exhibition. Yes, I got a warning email today saying that I, I better get there. You better, Jean. <laughs> yep. So I have two, um, I saw Titian, it was incredible. And then it, it is excellent, the restoration work, bringing the colors back is amazing. Yes, John Franco Pocobene uh, is our paintings conservator. The guy is so modest. He gets mad when I say this, but he's a genius and he's the best there is. He's just, I got to watch him do the Titian. So, you know, when you're watching TV, you see some of those shows and you see them, the before and after part of a painting. I get to see him do that in many paintings, but the Titian in particular and seeing like the finished part and the unfinished part. And it's this, holy moly, it's a, what a great, what a great memory. It was so amazing that the only time we ever did this, they took the Titian and set it up in the Titian room and he did it, you know, we put stanchions up and the public could watch him. 
uh, we did that for like a week and it was, wow, was that just unbelievable to see? Well, I love this question here. What is your favorite piece in the Godner? Great question. Favorite piece outside of the 13 stolen works, which I'm completely obsessed with, of course, is the um, <laughs> Madonna of the Eucharist by Botticelli on the third floor. It's this mm. round, um, round, actually the round one is behind, it's the baptism of Christ Botticelli. And then in front of you is this rendering of the Virgin that, you know, just, it's just so mesmerizing. And the way the light comes in from the side window makes it look different at different times of the day. In her veil, her transparent veil, I, I stand there trying to get my mind around the fact that he painted transparency and it's perfect. And the model he always uses, the woman that was the Venus rising and everything about that painting is just staggeringly beautiful. And I'm uh, a... Um, uh, believing in Christian too, so the painting really speaks to me. Oh, cool. I'm glad you like it too. <laughs> I love hearing your passion, Anthony. How uh, you, thanks, I love the way you. Oh, yeah. It's, I could sit and listen to you all night. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm going to call my partner in here and have you tell her that. See, see. There you go. Give her a hug. <laughs> Give her a hug. <laughs> She's your treasure. Oh, yeah, she is. She is. What a wonderful and fascinating talk. Certainly hope the gardener recovers the paintings. One of my favorite art museums, along with the Frick in NYC. Thank you. Good choices, Jody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Lucille, do you have any comments? I know you were so excited for this presentation. We chatted a little in the beginning. She probably doesn't. Lucille, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I did. I, I just okay. did not. I, I, I agree with you, Jean. Uh, Anthony, you, um, I was married to an artist for many years. And uh, to hear the way you describe how you're moved by this paint, these paintings that you live with almost, right? Are you there every day? Every day, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what a thrill. What a wonderful thrill. So the program was so, so terrific tonight. It's just Thanks. so hard to believe it's so hard to believe that we can't trace these things. Of course, they can't sell them, I guess, right? Because would, um, I don't know, how, could they think that's why they, that's why we don't see them, right? Because these people can't sell them. Are they well, saving for themselves? Are they, do they have them for their own enjoyment? No, they're no. just hiding them and they can only get them in trouble. Like, I just have to get them to trust me, whoever's holding them. But we talked about this before the program began. Uh, so Lucia, forgive me for repeating it, but I would ask, you know, if you remember how Whitey Bulger was caught, the way he was caught is um, essentially a public information campaign to people based on the premise that he has to emerge from wherever he's, if he's still alive, Sooner or later. his girlfriend's still alive, they have to go out for things. They have to, again, yeah. go to the doctors, go to CVS, get food. Human beings have to, you know, but um, paintings don't. You can hide a painting in an attic and leave it there for a hundred years. It's not going to walk out. You have to, people looking for it like me have to find it. It's not going to find me. You know, it's not going to stumble out of the house one day and someone ah, spotted. So that's what makes these things so difficult. Like I mentioned earlier, also, you know, if you get some sightings of a person that he might be, I'm in Winchester. So, oh, he he would, he might have been sent in Winchester. Then there's, that's a lead that you can, again, go talk to doctors in the area, check out the pharmacies, um, yeah. hang around these places. But a painting, if someone says it's in Winchester, so what? There's thousands of houses in Winchester. True, Which one true. is it in? Mm. So that's why it's so much harder. Was anything ruined it, when, they, when they cut it out of the frames? Well, cutting it out of the frame is a bad thing very bad thing but it's still the value is there but it can be it can be repaired it'll be easy and i john franco would go goes nuts when i say this. it'll be easily repaired uh -huh. i say that because i have so much confidence in him but listen this is a, john franco who did the titian this is a guy who got a painting that was on a wood panel an oil painting took the oil paint off the wood panel and put it on a canvas 
Uh, my in my book, if you can do that, you can do anything. My God, yes. Right? So, uh, so as soon as I hear that, and don't forget, I, I always say kind of nonchalantly to John Franco, I just my job is just to find them. You have to fix them. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, How did you get it? the program? Thank you so much, and Jean, thank you for arranging for us tonight this wonderful you're, program. You're very thank welcome. You. Thank you, and thank you, Anthony. Oh, my pleasure, Anthony. I missed the beginning, and I'm wondering if you mentioned this or not. How did you get into this line of work? Yeah. Which, you know, did you ever think you'd be doing something like this? I guess. How did you? <laughs> how did that all transpire? Well, in a nutshell, I I had. Uh, the first half of my career, I, I worked in a unique role as a special agent with FAA security. So I did a lot of security work, making sure airports were secure and learning how to secure buildings and such, and also doing investigations. And that's, believe it or not, it's a, a rare combination. Usually investigators don't do security and vice versa. I just happened to do both. And after 9-11, I did the security at... Um, Logan, and then oversaw the investigations inspections branch. And uh, once I felt that I had everything up going the way I wanted it to, I saw this job opening. I just looked, I just looked it up in an old newspaper. I saw the, the one that I saw in 2004. It was like this big, that's it. It was just this little back when jobs used to be in the newspaper. And I read it and I'm like, I'm surprised I applied for that. You know, I, but I did. And then I saw the place and I was like, Imagine coming to work here every single day. You know? so, but if you asked me then if I'd be there 16 years later, I said, no way, no way. But here I am. Great. So we do have an um, interesting FYI. The facade at the museum is a gift of a situate gale. Anne Howard Fitzpatrick. Oh, she's wonderful. I know Anne. Uh, the facade is the, uh, if you go in the new building to the entrance, the only way to get in now, you look up to the right, there's always an enormous contemporary artwork outside on the museum. And um, that's her that, that uh, bestowed that. We, we sort of refer to it as a gallery and she's awesome. What a wonderful person she is. One of my favorites. We're looking forward to your new book. Your storytelling is riveting. Yes, it is. Yes. Wow, thanks. Thanks. I, that gives me a lot of confidence because I have to, I'm starting to work on my next book now and uh, have to get that writing revved up again. And um, thank you. Uh, is it Austin? It's a cool name. Uh, thank you for, uh, please do look for that Miles article in Airmail. Okay. Um, yeah. Graydon Carter publication. Wonderful. Anybody else? Any other questions or comments or are we going to see everybody at the museum and now it's going to make everybody want to go and want to. Um, it looks like we have a new message here. What is it? What's your new book? Um, in the research phase, it's going to be a book about uh, actually I just got this autobiography. It's about um, Suffragettes in Great Britain at the turn of the last century. Um, it was Emmeline Pankhurst, if you ever heard of her. And what happened was Emmeline was like the Susan B. Anthony of Great Britain, but really an unbelievable woman. And um, her followers became very radical, uh, understandably, too. I don't blame them. They wanted to vote. So um, when she was put into jail, she went on a hunger strike and uh, different suffragettes went to different places and took meat cleavers to paintings, huh? including a sergeant and uh, most notably at a, a Velazquez, this woman, Mary Richardson. Oh my God. The National Gallery and the Rokeby Venus, which is considered the, was considered one of the most valuable paintings in the world. And his, his only surviving nude and she took a meat cleaver to this painting. It's just oh an God. unbelievable story. Yeah. Huh. No well, doubt, there's damage. We certainly look forward to that. And we think we'll have to have you visit us again when that comes out. Yeah, I hope have you check out the, the Woman Who Stole Vermeer. That's such a fun book. You'll be blown away by this woman, Rose Dugdale. It's incredible. Yes, it incredible. sounds quite interesting. Thanks. 
Okay. Well, I think if nobody else has any questions, we will end tonight. And thank you all for joining us. Anthony, once again, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank right. you. Yes. Thank you. It was wonderful. Happy um, Thanksgiving. Yes, everybody be well. And um, like I said, this is our last Zoom presentation of the year. So um, we're going to take a little break and follow our new website, please. SituateHistoricalSociety.org. Follow us on Facebook, sign up for the newsletter, and you'll hear about all of these um, interesting programs we're going to have next year. And good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you, Jean. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>